Executive Speaker Series for 2021. Um, my name is Joseph Solomon. I am an adjunct professor in the Master's of Real Estate Program, for those of you who do not know me. And uh, we are really excited and happy to have today um, our first uh, CEO of the uh, Speaker Series, David Singlin, with, uh, who is CEO and trustee of American Homes for Rent. Uh, David, welcome. Thank you. Um, we are going to structure today's um, talk uh, by first doing some introductions. Um, we'd like to get into your background, kind of your history and what kind of brought you to the stage that you're in now. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about American Homes for Rent. And um, we're gonna have a opportunity at the end to have our Pepperdine community ask some questions and do a question and answer session. Um, so go. um, welcome and thank you for being with us. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about um, your background to begin with, um, maybe your educational background because we do have students um, watching and how you got into real estate. Well, yeah, there is generally never a direct path to where you're going to end up uh, at the end of your career. Uh, I, I started uh, with uh, a degree in accounting. Uh, in the middle of my degree for accounting, uh, I chose to get a second degree in computer information systems. And to kind of tell you what the environment was uh, back in those days, uh, my degree in computer information systems was uh, completed. 100% on punch cards. So I never saw or touched a computer um, during my college days. Uh, and I still have a, a degree in computers. Uh, I, uh, I left, when I graduated, I started with what is today one of the big four accounting firms. Back then there were 10 big accounting firms. I started with Arthur Young. Today, Arthur Young is one of the companies that makes up Ernst & Young. And I left to uh, Ernst and Young or Arthur Young in those days and uh, went to Winchell's Donut Houses. It was one of my clients. I went in as a controller and uh, spent a few years there until they were selling themselves uh, to a Canadian company. And uh, at that time, I decided I did not want to um, be traveling up and down to uh, Canada. So I looked for another job and uh, was very fortunate to uh, land at public storage. Uh, and in my career at public storage, I started in the position of director of cash management and uh, progressed up to a controller role. Was public storage at that time public? Public storage was public um, at that time. And here's an interesting fact about um, when you get into companies. So it was public, uh, it had been around uh, for 17 years. And I thought when I joined public storage, I had missed all of the growth opportunities and all the fun that you get uh, growing a company. Now, when I started at public storage, public storage was a $900 million company, $900 million in assets. Today, they have $80 billion in assets. And I was there from 1989 through 2003 and saw that company uh, grow about 20 fold um, in that time period. And then I left uh, public storage in the US, but uh, didn't shake the public storage name. And uh, this is where your prior life sometimes comes back. And uh, I took over public storage in Canada. Uh, if you remember back into 2000, the early 2000s, there was new regulations that came out called Sarbanes-Oxley. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sarbanes-Oxley was a means of how to govern. And at the same time, there were a couple of corporate, uh, large corporate embarrassments and failures. Uh, Enron and uh, WorldCom were a couple of them. And so they put in a lot of controls that you needed to segregate uh, your, uh, your corporate lives from your personal lives. And our chairman at the time, uh, had a interest in public storage Canada. It was a public company in Canada. Public storage in the U.S. did not have an ownership interest, but managed all the assets. And it was decided for regulatory purposes, it would be best to split the two. So I had an opportunity. I was very, very young. 
uh, at the time to uh, become president of a very small publicly traded company uh, in Canada on the Toronto Stock Exchange. And uh, how old were you at that time? I was uh, in my late 30s. That's amazing. Late 30s. And, you know, it, it comes back to the fact that a lot of hard work um, throughout the uh, period before that puts you, one, in a position from a knowledge and experience standpoint, and two, um, you get tapped for opportunities uh, when you work hard. And so, so uh, I went up to Canada and I spent uh, a, a few years up there and uh, we started a U.S. private real estate company called American Commercial Equities. Uh, it's actually just down the street here in Malibu uh, is where it started. And uh, in 2010, 2011, uh, the founder of Public Storage uh, came to me, said uh, there's a big opportunity in his mind that you could buy homes, you could renovate them and you could lease them. So he and I got on a plane, we went to Las Vegas. This is 2011, so it's, uh, I guess, 10 years ago, and 10 years ago, May that we bought three homes in Las Vegas in May, three homes in Phoenix in June. Now what do we do? We got, we own six homes. So found uh, parties, uh, contractors, third parties to renovate the homes, found a leasing company to lease them, uh, replicated that program a number of times uh, during 2011 and said, we can make a business out of this. And, uh, started hiring some people and uh, put a business plan together. And today we uh, we're a very large New York stock exchange traded company. We have more than 50,000 homes across the country, a uh, billion dollars of revenue. And uh, the, to me, the future is brighter than the last 10 years. So oh, I'm really happy as to where we are. That's an amazing origin story. And, in some ways, it sounds like it was the bleak days of our, you know, our recession that kind of birthed well, American homes for uh, for rent. It, it, it was. Um, we we tend not to want to focus a lot on that. Um, that people's hardships are what uh, gave us an opportunity. But you're absolutely right. Uh, for us to be able to start American Homes for Rent, this is a company that owns uh, homes, like single family homes that are detached that many of us all live in. And for us to be able to buy enough of those and create a uh, company, a couple things had to happen that had never happened before. Uh, this is not a new industry, not a new industry by any means. Uh, to, uh, today, there are 17 million single family homes that are rentals. And less than 2% of them are owned by companies such as ours. So that means the, the balance, uh, the majority of the homes, 98%, are owned by individuals like you and I, mom and pops that we call them. Going back to 2011, they're 100% owned by mom and pops, a huge industry, and had never been institutionalized. Why? Well, in 2011, the two things that were different about that year than ever before where we had an economic opportunity that you just mentioned to be able to buy homes at a price that was below replacement cost and also below historical pricing. And that was important because for us to create the company, we were making two investments. People only see one, we were making two. We were buying the homes. And at the same time, we had to co-invest in this thing called a platform or our operating uh, systems. And when you look at what we were investing in the platform and adding it to what we were buying the homes for, then when you bought enough homes, 10,000 homes or so, then they averaged out to an average home price. But you had to have some way of financing and funding that acquisition or that building of that platform. That's one. The other one was technology was at a point in 2011 that was different than any time before. Mobile technology was different, but more importantly, the flow of data was very, very different than what we saw uh, before. We were underwriting over 50,000 homes to buy every single month 
Um, and we were buying 2,000 homes back at the beginning. You went from buying effectively six homes. Six homes. To buying 50,000 homes. No, per, evaluating. Evaluating 50,000 homes. Yep. So you were evaluating of, of this morass of homes that were coming. Were they all like distressed homes that we were buying? Uh, vast majority. So you had kind of this plethora of distress that you were kind of, you know, kind of mm-hmm. morass of homes you're going through. Um, so the issues that you touched on, though, so now you had all this opportunity that you're seeing. Mm-hmm. How did you differentiate those assets of the, of the ones that were available as prospects? And how did you get the financing required to scale mm-hmm. above where you were going? It's one thing to say it's a business model. It's another to actually scale it. And to also get the best, you know, to your, to your point, I guess, yeah. the, the platform to differentiate those good deals from uh, yeah. maybe not as good deals. Well, let's hit the first point and then we'll hit the, uh, the obvious point that real estate takes capital. Um, so and, and lots of capital. But how do you evaluate 50,000 homes comes back to data flowing very freely through an Internet, through uh, electronic means? Uh, having the bil- ability to create APIs into various data sources. Uh, and those data sources are everything into counties that uh, provide property tax records, into companies like CoreLogic that provide uh, other data. And uh, then you're also using the internet and scraping data from companies like Rent Range and Zillow and evaluating rents. Uh, on these homes and determining which of the 50,000 homes are going to be uh, good prospects economically. Once you get through that, then you continue to evaluate what's left and you want to make sure that you're buying a first deed of trust if it's a foreclosure, not a second deed of trust. You want to make sure that you know where the neighborhoods are. You want to know what the crime statistics are. You want to know what the school ratings are and all of that data was available uh, online. And it wasn't five years prior to that. Right. Um, and then we would actually have teams of individuals go around and uh, inspect the homes before we actually went to auction. Mm-hmm. And none of this is foolproof. I mean, we've made our, a number of mistakes along the way. One of those uh, stories is in Atlanta, uh, we were at, went out and looked at a number of homes that were on our list, and we evaluate the condition of those homes from the outside. And we went by, and the house was good, and then we bought it, and we went to the house, and there was no house there. It was burned down. Oh, wow. What had happened is we went and saw 123 Peach Drive, not 123 Peach Lane. <laughs> and a lot of peach. In yeah, Atlanta. well, the peaches are <laughs> a lot of peaches in Atlanta. Yes. So what came out of that was the need to create a mobile app that had geo technology in it that the individuals that went to look at the house would go take a picture, but they had to be in front of the right address to be able to take the picture. So we made a mistake. We learned from that mistake. There was an expensive mistake, but we learned from it. So integrating technology was integral, having, you know, new found internet access to data integral uh, to to your growth. Um, How about capital? Well, capital is uh, is the lifeblood of real estate. So uh, we were, I was very fortunate. Uh, The company started with a uh, a, a very, uh, a, a sponsor, an individual, who really believed in what we were doing. And we were very lucky to have hundreds of millions of dollars come from a private sponsor. That doesn't last long though when you're buying homes. Uh, We were buying our early homes at $175,000 a copy. And you uh, start uh, multiplying that by 10, 100, 1,000 and your money disappears very quickly. So we were very fortunate in uh, our early years, uh, we were in the uh, process of buying homes and got a telephone call from an individual that I had known and we had known because uh, Wayne, who is the founder of the company, was the founder of Public Storage. This individual was an investor in the early days of Public Storage. And he said that he understands that we are buying homes to rent. 
And we said, yes. And he, uh, at that point, said he wants to come down and meet with us. Well, at this time, his job was he was the chief investment officer for the Alaska Permanent Fund. And those that aren't familiar with the Permanent Fund, uh, that is the fund that collects money and royalties for all the oil that goes through the Alaska pipeline. And then it pays stipends back to the residents of Alaska. And so uh, he came down and uh, looked at what we were doing. Uh, and uh, the Alaska Permanent Fund uh, put in uh, uh, many millions of dollars and that carried us for a few more months. And this is, at this point, you've been around for how long? Two years. So you've been around for two years. Yeah, not, using- not even two years. It would be about probably 13, 14 months at that point. So Wayne's looking around and saying, all right, we got to get some other funds here. And this yep. life, lifeblood of sorts come, it came, comes in. And then we uh, went to Wall Street. We're still private, remember. And, and approximately how many, um, how much assets under management or how many homes, whichever metric you can roughly tell us, did you have at this point? Uh, between 10 and 12,000 homes. Okay. And we went to Wall Street. Uh, we used an investment bank by the name of Raymond James. Uh, Raymond James is an investment bank that is tied in to high net worth individuals. And we did a private offering. Uh, it's called a Reg D offering or a 144A offering for those that uh, are in securities classes. And uh, we went out and raised uh, um, about $500 million. And we went, that was in November of 2012. In February of 2013, $500 million doesn't go as far as it used to. We were out of money and we went and got another $700 million in February doing the same program. And then uh, get to August of uh, 2013, August 1st, we went public, did an IPO. Uh, so that's in two years. It was in two years. It was two, two years, years and three months. Amazing. That's it is. Um, you read it, it is the public storage story repeating itself on steroids. And and it's and you went public. We talked about this a little bit before we started. Uh, you didn't go public the way like right now is in vogue to go public through a SPAC vehicle. You, Nobody you, knew what SPACs were. Yeah, you, well, yeah, they're a small niche, right? But now you you went through a regular S one offering, an initial mm-hmm. public offering modality of, of doing things, which is a lot more difficult. And a, and a lot more impressive, I think. Yeah, well, we spent uh, many days, many hours uh, on planes. We, uh, so we, for 13 consecutive days prior to going public, we went all across the United States meeting with every large investor in the United States. Um, um, many, many hedge funds that many people won't know the names of, but a lot of large funds that people do the Fidelities, the T. Rowe Prices, um, the New Veens, the New Burger Bermans, uh, all of those companies we talked to and uh, raised money uh, for the IPO. And uh, that was great. Another $700 million. And um, now we have to start thinking about where the next amount of money comes from. And that was very important because We talk about this massive growth, but the massive growth was important to be a viable company. So I kind of take American Homes and I'll break it up into a few chapters. It's those days of scaling, which is viability. It's the days um, then after that, that you are going to build your property management platform. So you become efficient and you can create the income that you believe you can. Right. You can't do it using third parties. And as you indicated, uh, where did all this money come from? Well, after we go through the IPO, we start going into debt markets. And it was all in private debt, mortgage type debt, and got very levered because that's the, where the money was. That is not the way Wall Street works. And if you're highly levered, you're not going to raise money. So we went through a period of deleveraging and, uh, and basically got our balance sheet to where it is today. We have an investment grade rating uh, from Moody's and Standard & Poor's. And those, that investment grade um, was very early in the life cycle of a new industry. And in part, we got it because of how conservative our balance sheet was, but we had an industry that had a lot of uh, unknown risk components to it. 
And so the other piece is the quality of management. And, and I had been in Moody's offices 15 years earlier when I was at public storage and reputations matter. And so keep that in mind. That's what I want to touch on a little Mm -hmm. bit because you had this kind of hyper growth um, and you had, you know, private investors before you went public throwing money at you um, at at, uh, American Homes for Rent. You were also in a niche sector of real estate that wasn't probably as widely known or really in an existing kind of food group of real estate as it is known to be today, you know, uh, we, everyone knows about the multifamily market. Everyone knows about, you know, there are REITs that specialize in office or, you know, even more nuanced aspects of, you know, office buildings that specialize in banks or medical office. Um, or, you know, we can talk about retail sector all day long. But a sector that specialized in single family residential homes for rent was somewhat unique for the market to understand. So talk about that a little bit. Well, I think there's, certain challenges that we had um, because everybody believes they know what a home is and what it costs to maintain a home. And they're taking a piece of paper out and they're doing their own little math and saying, you'll never make a dollar. There's no way to make money um, doing this. Uh, I own a home. I know exactly what it costs to run a home. Well, yeah, but you're doing that in a very, you know, retail oriented way, not wholesale way. We, uh, we maintain our homes with our own maintenance. Uh, we have our own maintenance company, so basically. It's vertically integrated. Yeah, vertically from integrated. Acquisition through management, all the way through. through all, the yeah, we can talk about that if you want it after this, but not, we were one step past that. So and us. that is today, not only do we go out and buy homes, we manage the homes. Uh, and finance the homes. We are today the 45th largest home builder in the United States. And we started a development company, a construction a home building company uh, four, four to five years ago. And, uh, and I'm going to talk about the timing as well, because we're talking now, you, you had gone public at this point in 2013. There's still, the market still has supply of distressed assets at this point, but it's, it probably started to dwindle at some point. 2014, you started seeing dwindling. You started seeing prices go back up to replacement costs, not totally to retail of new homes, but close uh, today they are. Um, and so that opportunity to build that platform was very unique back in 2011. Uh, there are a number of people looking to do what we do and start their company today. It's a for me, it'd be much more challenging because we had a cost benefit to build our platform that is difficult to find today. You had a lower cost basis than anyone can have to yeah. do this today. Yeah. Well, and now people that want to start this company have to compete with us as well. And having that head start, getting that investment grade rating, uh, showing continued growth in your performance. And as, how are you achieving that? So tell yeah, us, because so, I think that's... Uh, yeah, so let me, what that means for me is that my cost of capital is very low. Uh, so I am, I'm earning uh, this year $1.32 in cash flow on my assets. My stock is trading for $40 on just a nominal yield basis, not an IRR, not a fully loaded um, return, but just the nominal earnings, that's 3%. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, earlier this year, we went out and raised 10-year, uh, 10-year unsecured money, two and a, uh, two and three eighths percent. Wow! And we did 30-year at three and three eighths. What that means is, if you want to now come into this industry, you have to compete with companies like us that have a very, very attractive cost of capital. Very low. Cost and, and so it's a very difficult barrier for entry for most people. Right. Makes sense. So. Where were you headed? But I was headed to now the concept of building homes. Yes. And the rationale, you started uh, build homes. Started to build homes uh, about five years ago. And talk to us about how that became accretive to the business model and how it's helping for the, for the overall growth of the, of the company Mm -hmm. uh, as, as you're going through kind of the cycles that we're going through now. I mean, we're in a market. I want you to talk about that because everyone wants to talk about where we are today in the, that cycle from single family residential homes. But yeah, so what we are talking about has now been coined with the term 
So it's called Build to Rent. And you can go out in the financial press and find article after article on Build to Rent or its acronym, BTR. Uh, so the reason we got into it first and foremost was to have a consistent and predictable uh, channel to grow. Uh, for those who have been in real estate for any period of time, we know that there are cycles in real estate and there are cycles where it, there is a tremendous opportunity to buy assets uh, and grow. Likewise, there's those times that the market shuts down. And for us, when the markets were shutting down because the equation or relationship between rent and acquisition cost was not feasible, we now have another channel. So we built it to have the predictability and consistent channel. What we have also determined is that we get a much better return by building than we do by buying. And if you think about the equation that today homes are basically trading at a retail price equal to what you can buy from a home builder. And if we went to a home builder and bought a home, we are paying a development profit to that home builder as well as sales and marketing right. cost. So when we build the same home, we're going to do it for 20 to 25% less investment than if we bought it. But the bigger benefit is we can build a better home, a different home, one designed for uh, rentals. And what does that mean? Well, thing, you'll, you use different materials. When we build a deck, especially in the East Coast, we're not going to build the deck away a traditional home builder does. They use raw wood. Uh, it's the cheapest way to build the home. They have to warranty it for one year. No problem with raw wood for one year. We're going to be the owner of that home for many, many years, decades. And that means that we're going to have to maintain it. We're going to have to waterproof it every two years. And that's labor and that's materials. If we use composite wood, which is like Trex, that's a brand name, but that's the type of wood we're talking about. We don't have to maintain it and it's going to look better much longer. Well, but then doesn't that imply that you're spending more, you know, composite is more expensive than wood. Absolutely. So you're paying more up front, but you're amortizing it over a 10-year period. So over the life of the ownership, it's less. That's right. And so and when you look at material cost, don't forget the labor that's always associated with putting materials in. So the additional cost to go replace a deck uh, not only are you going to have to put new wood out there, but you're going to have to have the labor to do it. If you're going to go waterproof it, you have the materials, you also have the labor. Almost always you will find labor is more expensive than materials. And so when you do the IRRs on putting in higher quality materials, just on the economics of that, uh, it's, it's an easy payback. It's double digits IRRs but you also get an intangible benefit and that's a better looking house that's got marketability. And that's an intangible that I'm not even factoring in. So it's, it's actually counterintuitive, but you're, you're building a better house is what you're saying. Oh, I'm absolutely building a better house. Um, but the other thing is I built a cheaper house in some respects because all of the houses are of the, basically the same models. It's not one model. You'll never build one model. It's the, the cities require multiple uh, different models, so you have a little bit of differentiation. But we have no owner uh, options. So there is not all the appliances in all the houses will be the same. Uh, all of the uh, designs are going to be the same with no customization, with plugs and lighting. And that makes the work process much more efficient, make, mean, meaning the cost is going to be cheaper to build those homes. So uh, we've found a little niche on how to build homes. So it's, uh, it's a beautiful niche. And I, it speaks also to, I think, a regulatory environment. I want to talk about that a little bit. What markets, first of all, are, are you in on the rental business? And then what markets are you going into on the build to rent business? Yeah, so we're at we're in a lot of markets. We're in 22 states. We're in uh, nearly 40 markets uh, across the United States. Maybe we should talk about what markets you're not in as much as the markets you are in as well. So, well, we're in, we're in big and little. So uh, we're in Boise. 
uh, for instance, a great market. So how do we pick our markets? We are looking for markets that have growth in population, growth in employment that outpaces the US averages. And then we overlay, it's an interesting thing, you bring up the word uh, regulations, then we overlay regulations uh, because there are some states that are very, very difficult to operate in. And then when you determine what markets you wanna be in, then it gets down to neighborhoods. Real estate is a neighborhood game. Uh, to say that you are in California means nothing. To say that you're in Southern California means nothing. To say that you're in LA County means nothing. Uh, to say you're in Malibu, we're getting a little bit more specific. Now let's talk about whether you're in what part of Malibu. Uh, and when you get down to that, now we're in neighborhoods, the crime statistics are gonna be different. The school quality is going to be different and the demand for your rentals are, is going to be different. And so I'm a big believer in data analytics and there's a lot of data out there, a lot of it that can be published uh, or purchased. Uh, some of it's free, and then a lot of it's uh, homegrown uh, as well. But uh, you, you've got to look at your analytics. You've got to go where the demand's going to be. Uh, but further to the issue of regulatory issue that like matters, mm -hmm. um, are you going effectively after demographics and then determining, okay, that this is, you know, we can't beat California demographics, for example, but are you guys actively pursuing markets that are tougher regulatory where California is probably at the top in terms of regulatory, you know, red tape and uh, hurdles? Yeah. Well, there's, there's a lot that you factor in. So just taking California, let's look at what the cost is to acquire an asset, whether you build it or, or purchase it okay. and what type of rent can you get in this marketplace? And then you take that and you look at what the ultimate yields are going to be. And you can put in your, you put in your growth as well, but you're just starting with your current yields. They're gonna be far less than opportunities you have in Phoenix, in Las Vegas, in Salt Lake City, in Boise. And when you look at the regulatory environment, it creates an uncertainty as to what the long-term growth is going to be in this marketplace. And so, and the other piece that you have is it's the long-term growth of the ability to add assets, but it's also what is the rent control? What are the other regulations going to do to your ability to operate? Are you in any markets that are rent controlled and have you been impacted by, you know, kind of pandemic related uh, overlay issues like moratoriums on rent? Yeah. So, uh, Everybody who is in real estate, I don't know if there's a category of real estate that's not impacted by the pandemic. So uh, that's not something when we evaluated markets, you know, we evaluated it's what's going to happen in a pandemic. It's, that was so, it's, it's, once, in a, it's, yeah. it's, it's right. once in a hundred years right. and uh, I haven't quite experienced that before. So, um, but yes, we are all impacted by the pandemic. And how you act through that pandemic and how you come through that pandemic um, is going to add long-term value to your company. Uh, and it adds that value and reputational value. And that reputational value will turn into consumer demand. And you know, we, we did get impacted. Um, and everybody in our industry did. Uh, and it's not the, really the institutional single family operators that I was super concerned about. I mean, we, we're large enough, we have liquidity, we're going to survive through that process. Go back to what we were talking about earlier. 98% of homes that are rented are owned by individuals like yourself and, and myself. And if you are the unlucky one to own a, one asset and your tenant's not paying, you now have a liquidity issue yourself. Now you can't pay your mortgage. And all of that snowballs into an unwind that is going to be a little bit dicey in the next six months. You're going to see an increase in foreclosures. That is actually good for me. Uh, I don't, that's not a nice thing to say, but it will be. It'll create opportunities for us. Uh, but those are the people so that are you forecasting from. in six months that there is going to be a little bit of this kind of echo effect where there have been. Uh, whether related to the pandemic or, you know, the, you know, job markets or whatever, 
that will result in there being more foreclosures. I'm, I'm sure we're seeing it in the data actually that there are some more yeah. non-payments of you know mortgages kind of hitting pre-foreclosure activity hitting, but you're seeing that kind of uh, the REO market's kind of hitting a little bit more of inventory in about six to nine months. Is that what you believe? Well, it's it's compared to the prior 12 months, absolutely, because we were zero. Right. We had all these moratoriums, so right. we had zero going on. So it's going to unwind. It's going to be, I think, a little more controlled than we saw in 2008 through 2012. I think people, uh, including the lenders, learned some lessons. Right. But you're also going to see a tremendous amount of disruption in the rental market. Uh, we have, uh, you know, our bad debts typically are nine tenths of one percent. They're two and a half percent through this program. Doesn't sound like a big number, but just take that and multiply it by fifty thousand homes, and so now we've got you know a thousand plus homes that tenants aren't paying, and they're going to be moved out. And most of them will not go through an eviction. Most of them will move on their own. And then they will need to figure out how they're going to find shelter. And so there's going to be a lot of disruption. Doesn't mean that it's it's bad. Doesn't mean it's good. It's going to be disruption. Means there's opportunities in that. But it, it's not going to be business as usual for the early part of 2022. Do you feel that your quality of tenant is a little bit of a like higher quality, higher demographic, higher income earning demographic, uh, or do you feel that it's basically the same demographic that be going into an apart traditional apartment building? Yeah. So the demographics, um, you, you look at demographics two ways. You look at um, the the tangible pieces that will be uh, what is their income, what's their ability to pay rent. Uh, do what's their credit scores, all of those economic indicators. And our average uh, household income is uh, over $100,000. We, we do not have a large presence in California. We have no presence in the Northeast. So what that translates to is an average of over five times uh, the rent. But then the other things that you want to look at when you get back into these analytics are going to be who are these individuals? These are individuals that have been, uh, they have young families, they want yards, they do not want to live in multifamily, they want good school districts, they want the benefits of single family living, and they don't want the obligations, and they don't want the, uh, they want the flexibility that renting provides them. And that's a little bit different um, characteristic in today's renting population. A couple of things that are different between the millennials, the Gen X, Gen, Gen Zs, and compared to their parents, uh, my generation. And that's going to be that they are ha starting their households later. They are renting a lot more. They're more likely to use, uh, use Uber and Lyft than they are to buy a car. Uh, but the concept of starting in their life events later, the concept of getting married later, having children later, means that they ultimately will buy a house, but they're going to be a renter for a longer period of time. The other thing that's happened over the last 10 years is people now have understood the value proposition of single family living. One thing that institutions have done, they put a spotlight on what the quality opportunity is of single family living. Nobody really knew before. Right. And people had a perception, which is probably 90% true, that it was in rundown neighborhoods with very long, tall grass that the landlord wouldn't return your call. A lot of that is true. That is not the way that single family rentals are today, especially from the, the institutional brands. And so it is a high quality housing option. I, I appreciate that. And I want to actually segue to, to talk about that because you're building communities. And I want to talk about mm -hmm. how you're building this you know, your communities in these various parts of the country um, so that it is providing a lifestyle um, where at a, you know, where there's more than just, you know, a place to live. There's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the whole life cycle, whether uh, religious institutions nearby, parks, outdoor areas um, for the kids, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, 
transport, as you alluded to, you know, what what are you doing to give back to these communities that you're going into um, beyond obviously building, you know, um, homes um, to kind of lift the, the neighborhood, you know, um, to improve the lives of all in that area? Yeah. Well, when you say we're building communities, we literally are building communities. We are buying tracts of land and we are building houses where we are building 100 homes, 150 homes, 200 homes in a subdivision, all for rentals. Uh, and we are building amenities throughout uh, those neighborhoods. We are putting in gyms, we are putting in uh, infinity pools, we're putting in dog parks, we're putting in children's parks. Uh, when we talk about these communities, uh, a little news flash uh, today, and that is, uh, we've just built our 100th community, opened, opened up the uh, um, for leasing our 100th community across the United States. So uh, you heard it here first, you'll get to see the press release on Monday. Um, so it's coming out. Uh, so that that's there. But there, there's a number of things when we talk about uh, giving back. Um, we as a company uh, focus a lot on a concept that is known as ESG, environmental, uh, social, and governance. And it's something that is important to all of our stakeholders. And stakeholders are more than shareholders. It's more than your investors. It is your resident. It's your employees. And how you treat all of those constituents is important and goes to reputation. So we work on giving back into our communities. We have programs in each of our offices called planting seeds, uh, kind of bringing in the, the home uh, theme back into it. And planting seeds is a, a, a community program where our employees give back to the communities and the company gives back to the communities that we operate in. And it's just one of the things that we do uh, in addition to building out uh, neighborhoods. And that, that social factor is important for a community like ours here. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, what do you see the, uh, you know, the growth of this industry becoming overall? Um, you know, the rental business is uh, right now, I think, in everyone is kind of looking at it. You know, we've got a very hot market, single family mm -hmm. residential market. Uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier. You know, we've got... Uh, millennials and gen, you know, zeros who are waiting for that kind of inflection point in the uh, single family residential market, so they yeah. have their little, uh, you know, opportunity to get in. A lot of people's lives, in some ways, you know, their memes about their lives being on hold in some ways, so that they can they can have that opportunity to get yeah. in. Uh, as someone who is, you know, in that market, what advice would you give? whether our, our student bodies or students or anyone looking to get into the single family residential market, give some insight to, to know, buy a house. Huh? Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a tough market, right? Well, it, you're, it you're, is a tough market and uh, you know, maybe this is not what you want to hear, but I don't see it getting any easier. Uh, if you go back and you look at the last 12 years, the last 12 years, we've had more household formations in the United States than new housing stock. So we have continued over 12 years to build a housing deficit in this country. And the housing deficit is bigger than what the charts say. Because when you think of the fact that we've got 1.4 million uh, new households being formed every year and we're, we were building 800,000 or 700,000 new homes, what's not in that equation is housing obsolescence. So you've got to actually build more than new household formations to even stay in equilibrium. Uh, we're not even building that. So we are have a huge, huge deficit. Uh, today, there is a tremendous opportunity to buy because interest rates are still low. And that is few, that combined with the uh, housing shortage is fueling a, a, a spike. It's a huge inflation in housing costs. Uh, when you look at home price appreciation in the last year, what housing prices have done, um, they, they're double digit in every major uh, community across the country. Rental rates are approaching double digit increases across the country. Why? Because they're following the home price appreciation. Right. But that is uh, that deficit is going to remain for at least a decade. 
but it will get moderated a little bit. It, there's other in, influences in housing prices, and the big one is going to be interest rates. And when you look at the interest rate curves that we look at, uh, interest rates appear to stay uh, low for quite some time. If you look at just the technicals, however, I would tell you my intuition says there's a lot of inflation that is occurring, and interest rates and inflation uh, tend to go in lockstep, yeah. um, with one exception, and we may be repeating that exception, and that exception was World War II. And what happened in World War II is the government kept interest rates down while there was a lot of inflation, so they could inflate out of their debt. And I think that may be a little bit of what we're doing today is allowing the Treasury Department and Fed to allow the country to inflate a little bit out of the debt. So in, in short, if you find something as a retail buyer that fits your budget, take advantage of the interest rate market, yeah. lock it in for 30 years. If, if it's the good asset, um, you know, it's all about the quality of the asset at the end of the day. Right? You, know, you can't replace you know, good assets. You can't uh, fix bad assets in every situation. Location matters. Generally speaking, on a macro level with regard to real estate, what do you see as being the opportunity uh, as far as investment in real estate goes in terms of asset types, perhaps? Um, obviously, you know, yeah. everyone, you know, can, can buy shares in your company. It's hard, you know, barrier to entry. People can try and go buy a single family residence and rent it out. They won't get the scale that you get. What are the opportunities as you see them in well, real estate? You know, and first thing is, why are you investing in real estate? You've got to ask yourself, why do you want to invest in real estate? And for me, real estate is a, is a hard asset. It's going to, it's a limited asset. There's only so much land that you can build on. And it's going to survive uh, all economic cycles. It may not be a sexy investment like you would get in techs, but it's going to be a stable investment. So, as long as you are, again, buying right, then it's, it's a good investment to make. If you have the wherewithal to make a large investment, then you can look at buying real estate directly. If not, there's a lot of opportunities through real estate investment trusts or other ways to invest. Look at the quality of the company. It's like looking at the quality of the real estate. Um, the categories of real estate, this is my personal opinion. Uh, you know, retail is very different today than it was pre-Amazon days. So that industry is going through a, a transition today. Uh, I think you're going to see a transition similar to retail happening. We haven't really figured out where it's going to land in office. And COVID has changed a lot. And we do not understand the, the breadth of what COVID has changed. It's going to create a lot of opportunities. And those that are looking for those opportunities can capitalize on opportunities. What, where they are, I'm not 100% sure, but they are out there. Uh, but things that were traditionally strong assets, office buildings, are not going to be occupied to the same occupancy levels that they were pre-COVID. Uh, this, re, this work from home uh, environment that we live in today is going to be around for some period of time. So... It, that's how I would look at real estate today. So uh, some questions from students. Okay. Can, uh, kind of transition to that. And, and you're welcome to throw your, uh, your questions at us and I'll do my best to get to, to all of them. Uh, so Jacqueline is asking, some say that there are large tax increases anticipated to make up for the never ending money printing going on. Uh, how do you see potential property tax increases impacting things uh, and your profit, profitability? Do you see, I guess, more importantly, uh, we have a huge, you know, proposed uh, tax, uh, Biden tax uh, uh, program that's kind of impending. No one really knows what's what's going to happen. Um, there's a question as to capital gains increases um, uh, and what they're, there's inevitable that it's going to be there. There are questions as to 1031, you know, whether it's going to be around or not around. Um, yep. I, I personally have an opinion that's not going anywhere, but I'm curious to see your opinion there. Yep. Let's talk about that. How do you see... Uh, kind of governmental, you know, tax increases, uh, paradigm shifting, 1031, you know, potentially going away. Um, I'll let you have that. 
Yeah, so the way I heard her question, Jacqueline's question, it started with property taxes. So yes. let me hit property taxes because property taxes to me are very, very different than income taxes. Property taxes affect all individuals. Uh, anybody who owns at least residential property taxes uh, affect all individuals. And there is less likelihood of increasing the property taxes than there is to play with the income tax laws that impact corporate and what is now termed the one percenters. So that on property taxes, I think, is the guiding principle. I will say, though, that local governments do have to figure out how to pay for the services in their um, municipalities. So some municipalities are forced to increase either property taxes or fees. Uh, we are seeing a little bit of that uh, in, in a couple of very select markets. Uh, uh, Nashville, for instance, has a very large tax increase occurring right now. But as a general rule, you don't see huge increases in property taxes. On the income tax side, I my personal belief is income taxes um, are going to change uh, as the parties change. And right now we're in a area where they there's been many many years that proper or income taxes um, have had reduction changes that have benefited um, taxpayers, and a lot of those are need to get reversed. And, and will be reversed. So I do see capital gains going up. Uh, I don't think it's going to go up to the Biden program of 39%, but it's going to go up 25, 28% is probably where it lands. Uh, 1031, it's a little, it's almost too complicated for them to figure out. I don't think that gets changed. Uh, the income taxes, um, just the general amount going up, yeah, that'll go up. And then they'll play around with a lot of things that um, get a lot of press time that have very little impact to many people, whether it's uh, Roth conversions or things like that. So those, those won't have a big impact. What you will probably see, this is again, just my intuition speculation, is a very, very small short-term impact uh, caused by selling of securities uh, at the end of this year. Uh, to lock in lower taxes, uh, forcing a little bit of the stock market down, and that will recover early next year. It's okay. so, yeah, so it's a short-term impact. It won't be a long-term impact. Dave, that's exactly what I heard on CNBC this morning. It's, it's an and I didn't listen to it. So <laughs> that's, that's perfect, though. That's interesting. It's consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, another question Sin is asking, you know, why do you not do as much business in California and the Northeast? It's, I think, touching a little bit on the regulatory questions. But yeah. tell, us, tell us your perspective on California and the Northeast for your business. Well, I, I you know, this, this is my opinion. This is why American Homes is not there. Uh, it's not an opinion shared by all. Uh, single family rental company. So we may be right, we may not be right. But, you know, in our asset allocation, we've shied away from California due to the fact that you have lower yields, you have a very, very expensive product in the state of California, uh, and you have a different regulatory environment here than most states. And it's, it's not any one of those by themselves, it's just the intuitive uh, it, it's, it's the aggregation of all of those that causes me a little bit more concern about the long-term marketplace. The long-term marketplace, meaning the next 10 to 20 years. If I was looking at it for the next couple of years, it wouldn't bother me. But the next 10, 20 years, I, I think you have better opportunities in other markets. When we started, we talked about why we are in various markets, what we use to look at um, our asset model to choose markets that we invest in. It is population growth and it is job growth. And right now, California is on the decline, not on the in, uh, not on uh, generating new growth. Uh, first time in the history of California that it's on a decline. Uh, those jobs are going to Boise, it's going to Salt Lake City, Las Vegas, Phoenix, uh, Austin. And those are the markets that we're invested in. So it, it's a philosophy as to where we see the long-term growth. And uh, that's, again, comes back to data analytics. And sometimes you get it right, 
you pray, you hope that the majority of the time you get it right. Sometimes you don't. Demographics drive things. Um, Demographics drive. So uh, question again from uh, one of the students. I'm going to read this verbatim. What do you say to people who are concerned that public companies are outbidding private buyers, uh, thereby inflating the cost of real estate, in turn driving the private buyers into rentals? Yeah. So the data doesn't support that. So um, when you look at the number of homes that trade in the United States each year, um, we're, we're trading in excess of 5 million homes every single year. The number of homes that are trading into uh, institutions that are buying these homes, whether for cash or otherwise, is less than 50,000 a year. Do the math, it's less than 1%. And uh, that's not driving the, uh, it, it's not driving the, the rates up or the prices up. It may act a little bit, and I do believe it did act in the foreclosure prices uh, as a little bit of um, establishing a floor, but it's not driving the, the prices up. It is good rhetoric, though. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, as uh, questions come in, I will... Uh... Uh, we're getting the one minute. Getting the one, okay, well, last question then. Um, what market state do you think will be the market uh, to invest in? Um, are there any particular markets that you, uh, you've mentioned Boise a few times, but. Yeah, Boise is a little bit of a sleeper market. Uh, there's a lot of Californians moving to Boise. Um, people in Boise, I don't think are as happy about it as the Californians moving there are but we see tremendous uh, growth. Um, the home price appreciation there uh, is uh, not triple digit, but it's nearing triple digit last year. So uh, very, very hot market to uh, Boise. But uh, the West Coast has uh, got a lot of good markets. Uh, Seattle is very strong. Salt Lake City is very strong. Denver is very strong. Austin is very strong. Um, Austin, the thing with Austin is uh, there is a lot of land, and you're not going to get the same appreciation in that market uh, due to the constraints of land. So very, very strong. Okay. With that, I want to thank you, Dave, for thank joining you, us Joseph. at our uh, first uh, Graziato Executive Speaker Series uh, of the year. Yeah. Uh, it was wonderful having you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you all. Thank you.